It's Monday. <laughs> Welcome to Real Talk on this May 17th. The show presented, of course, as you know, by our title sponsors at Bitcoin. Well, you can find them right at the top of the page under the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. If you've got questions about crypto, if you're trying to make sense... You're trying to make sense of what's going on, whether you're going, well, hang on. Some of my buddies are talking about Ethereum. Some of them are talking about Dogecoin. And then and then Elon Musk bought a bunch and, and then he sold a bunch and said it's junk. And is he just playing with the market? Is this whole thing a joke? Because if I'm going to put my hard-earned money into it, I need to know that it's serious and that it's real. And is it really? And, and, and what's really real anyway, man? They've got real live human beings at Bitcoin Well that can answer these questions. You're not going to be the first one to ask them. And they can point you in the right direction, help you make sense of this whole wild world. Again, online, right at the top of the sponsors page at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. A good Monday morning to you. We're good to be, uh, or glad to be back at it live on this May 17th. We've got a lot of ground to cover today coming up uh, on the show in about half an hour's time. We're going to talk to uh, an advocate for uh, and a representative of migrant farm workers. You know, these are uh, some of the folks that, that, let's be honest, Canadians probably don't uh, know enough about, probably don't pay close enough attention to. Two, you, you, you see certain statistics or numbers in the news. For example, people will say, well, immigration was up or border numbers were up or there was some some more international travel in the spring. People try to make sense of this. Stuff. You go, why? Well, nobody thinks about the fact that migrant workers are coming in. You talk to any local producer, you talk to a farmer, a rancher, uh, regardless of what crops they're growing, chances are at some point they're tapping into uh, a labor market outside of what might qualify as local. But what's life like for these folks that come here to work, that come here to support their families, especially in pandemic times, especially especially in the context of, of health and wellness and safety. What about when it comes to, to COVID-19 protections or, or what about vaccines? We're going to get into this with an organization, the Association of Mexicans in Calgary. Vanessa Ortiz will join us, as will an individual by the name of Clyde um, a former migrant farm worker who, who may be looking to secure work again. We're going to talk to him and find out. He, he's got some concerns. They've been, they've been trying to, to sort out whether or not he's willing to go on record here because, as you can imagine, it, it's significant to, to step forward, to take a stand and say, here's how, how we're being treated or, or in some circumstances, maybe here's how we're being mistreated. We're going to learn more about this coming up. In, and, and this is a segment that's been prompted in part by many of your emails and your correspondence with the show, which we appreciate, including uh, from Joan, who sent us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com a while ago. And I'll read a portion of Joan's email before we have that conversation. We are also in about an hour from now going to have an opportunity to talk to Dr. Jennifer. Uh, Sarah, if we figured out, is it Mather or Mather? Do we know it? Probably Mather. Jennifer Mather. I'll I'll Correct. clarify with her when we talk to her. You probably already have. <laughs> She's here's what's here's. No, I was going to say here's what matters most. If someone's mispronouncing your surname, that matters. Let me not say this matters most. What's most exciting about this is that the good doctor is one of the consultants. She's like a scientific consultant, a scientific advisor on the documentary that absolutely blew my freaking mind when I watched it several days ago. My octopus teacher. I came here on the show and I couldn't stop talking about it. And, and then our live chat lit up and Twitter was lighting up and and some people had seen it and we're going, right, right. It's so amazing, right? But more feedback came from real talkers who in, in the days following our conversation on the show about my octopus teacher took the time to watch it. And, and, and basically, if I can say the consensus feedback was, whoa, like a mind blowing story. So, so. I don't remember how this got on our radar. Was this you digging? How did we find out that there's a Lethbridge connection to my octopus teacher, which won, by the way, an Academy Award at the at the recent Oscars? I think that was what prompted it is the Oscars. And then, hey, yeah. there's an Alberta connection, a landlocked Alberta connection to a deep sea like creature. <laughs> on a Lethbridge, what? which on is amazing. <laughs> so so uh, she, Dr. Mather's a, a psychologist, right, and, and has been a, a professor in the Department of Psychology, at University of Lethbridge for like 35 years. And we're going to find out. Um, how this came about. I can't wait for that conversation. Quite frankly, we could probably do 90 minutes 
just talking about no, I was, I was going to say octopuses, octopi. I, I noticed that you've been polling your Twitter followers on yes. this. Do you, have, do you have an update for? I mean, this was this was uh, was it a trick question? This poll that you put out. <laughs> what, what was this all about? You were asking people. Why would I try to? No, you know, I mean, I trick just people because I think most people that that are feeling pretty pretty informed on the subject are going to go. Well, it's, it's obviously octopi. Yeah. So I put out a, a Twitter poll saying, "What is the plural?" Of octopus. Yeah. And maybe I should have put a disclaimer in there or just like a flag. Hey, 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 no Googling. Zero Googling. Yeah. <laughs> and so on the uh, poll, I said, is it octopi, octopods, or octopuses? Mm-hmm. And 82, as you can see there, 82% mm-hmm. uh, said octopi. And I Which wish- is wrong. I see. I'm going to vote now to bump it up again because that's what I would have said. Yeah, wrongo bongo, my wow. friend. Okay. <laughs> we okay. are actually the the correct answer is octopuses. Octopuses. However, if you were to say octopuses out loud in a conversation, <laughs> most people would think you're a bit of an idiot. They Absolutely. think you're they think you're a bit of a maroon. <laughs> but you'd be right. You'd be right. Okay. Well, I'm I'm really excited for this conversation coming up. We're obviously following other news of the day. If you're if if you care, um, if you're listening to us or or catching this show from from Alberta, uh, if you live in Edmonton or you're paying attention to Edmonton politics or for that matter, uh, if you pay attention to Canadian politics, you may be interested to know that that uh, former federal minister of natural resources of infrastructure, Amarjeet Sohi, a former Edmonton city councilor, will add his name to the mix today of those seeking the mayor's chair, the municipal election in Edmonton and Calgary coming up uh, this fall, coming up in October. Um, Amarjeet Sohi joins other either current or former city councillors, uh, Michael Oshry, who just declared. Uh, Oshry is an interesting one as well. We can talk about that in just a little bit. Um, Kim Cruschel, uh Mike Nichol, uh, uh, Cheryl Watson, who is actually – sort of paying keen attention and participating in our live chat on Friday during our innovation roundtable, which was great to see Cheryl Watson there in the mix uh, and others. And apologies if on the fly, I'm forgetting about somebody, but, but it's kind of a, what, what a lot of people are, are noting here is that it, the, the Edmonton mayor race gets a little bit crowded in the middle um, with regards to, you know, if you, if you vote for one guy, there, there's, there's kind of the candidate that's that, you know, the no new taxes guy, uh, you know, Mike Nichol, kind of the, um, I'm going to say, the favorite of the low information voter, right? The person that, that doesn't, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not even trying to be funny. I mean, prove me wrong. It's, it's the people that will believe that no new taxes or lower taxes under Mike Nickel. Okay. You know, Mr. Nickel, um, you know, the province is downloading costs on municipalities. You have no other, uh, you can't run deficits. You have no, so what's your plan, mm. right? How are you, how, and you know, if he can answer those questions, more power to him, but, but you know, so people are going to, some people will vote there. Um, and, and then you have probably so he kind of uh, you know, some people will will perceive Amarjeet so he to be the front runner. He probably is. Um, but for a lot of folks, I know, you know, especially the business community, they may feel some some aversion to voting for Amarjeet so he based on either their perception of him or, or what they believe that city council might look like under his his direction. And then you've got these candidates kind of in the middle. And I would and I would say that, you know, Cheryl Watson, Michael Oshry, Kim Cruschel, if if you ask folks, what are the main differences between those three? They may have a difficult time answering, at least on first glance. Now, obviously, we've got to give these candidates runway. We've got to give them the months that they're going to need to roll out robust platforms and to participate in debates in whichever way they can. But those are the three I would say are kind of kind of clumped up together in the middle, which would lead me to believe that at some point, not right now and not two weeks from now, but at some point, one or two of those are going to drop out of the race. I think I think that that just that goes without saying. I don't see Amarjeet Sohi dropping out. I don't see Mike Nickel dropping out. So you'll probably have one or two of those other three dropping out to, to kind of, um, you know, create more of a scenario where there's not splitting, where, where all of a sudden you have three candidates each taking between, you know, let's say 15 and, and 40,000 votes mm. kind of a thing. Well, looking at it, I mean, the municipal election is on October 18th. So we've got a, a ways to go yet. I was just trying to look up the number of candidates that brings us to, which well, I'm because there's always like hard there, to keep track. Well, and and you always have to in, in mayoral races, and I say this respectfully, but you've all, you've got to look at, at at like how many candidates and then how many like candidates. candidates. I mean, how how many technical candidates are there, and then how many real candidates are there? 
And uh, and I don't mean to sort of spit in the face of the democratic process. I don't mean to insult people. I, I love when people become engaged politically. I respect anybody that runs, that puts their name out there, that knocks on the doors, that raises the money, that puts the team together, that gets the volunteers together. I think that's great. Um, you know, but the reality is at, at, at some point people are going to start to say, here, here are the front runners and what are the implications and the race kind of sorts itself out. So that's going to be an interesting one. Absolutely. I mean, even looking in Calgary, I think right now there's 14 candidates uh, up for the, yeah. in the mayor's race. So. Including one that, that found himself wearing the silver bracelets over the weekend. Sure did. Yeah. Kevin yeah. Johnson. We haven't, we haven't talked a lot about this guy. Uh, you know, I, this, this is the type of situation where I, I wrestle with. As a, as a public commentator, you go, do you give someone oxygen and do you talk about them and do you amplify them to a certain degree uh, or, or do you ignore someone at your own peril? Right. And this is this is the guy who's uh, I mean, people can re- keep up in Google Kevin J. Johnson, and they're going to learn a lot about this guy. He's been he's been charged with several things. He's been convicted of several things. Um, he's got he's he's had a, a, a what is it? A two million dollar, I think, defamation suit uh, against him. Uh, he's he's been he's been uh, convicted on that. I mean, the, the guy's in the hole. Um, he's he's uh, he's as, as Donald Trump would say, this guy's a bad hombre. This is the guy that's threatened to show up armed at Alberta Health Services workers' homes. Uh, I mean, this guy's a, a real wingnut. And, um, and, and one of the big stories out of Calgary over the past week or so is the Calgary police acknowledging that, that they're part of a process where folks are concerned that you know candidates for mayor get voters lists. They get the names. You live in Calgary. He's going to have your name and your address. And that's the type of person who you'd be rightfully concerned if he had your personal information. He found himself arrested over the weekend. He sure did. Yeah. Um, so he held a, a church... Uh, service on Saturday, yeah, and that was the just the day after he had a restraining order put in place beca- uh, for AHS Alberta Health Services because he's made um, numerous threats against workers and locations of Alberta Health Services. So you see the video of him, the video that surfaced a while ago, where he, he was talking about he was sitting in a vehicle. I don't know if you saw this one or not, and he was he was talking about uh, how how you know. Calgary's mayor, he's calling him Nahid Nenshi, saying he, he doesn't. Have, he's basically talking about how how everything is going to change when when Kevin becomes mayor. He says he starts talking about his army. He says, and by that I'm referring to the Calgary police. And he starts talking about what his army is going to do. Oh yeah, I mean this guy's. But I would say like dismiss a guy like this at your own peril. Someone will say, well he's not going to be elected mayor. And I sit there and I think, well you know you you also sort of wonder about the the number of votes a guy like this might get and what it might say about the city. It's 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 a pretty wild. I mean, you typically will have one or two characters uh, throwing their names That's in the a hat. Great way of putting it. it. Well, I'm you know I'm trying to. <laughs> no, I like it. You know, but I, and, and and don't get me wrong. Now someone's going to say, "Oh, Jesperson dismisses this guy as simply a character." I'm just saying, in every in every mayoral race, there are a couple folks that are that are typically most times entertaining. Uh, I wouldn't characterize this guy as entertaining, but but they're fringe candidates. And he would qualify, but but when you start to see, um, you know, some of the trends around anti-masking and hesitance and and all that, you kind of wonder what sort of support this guy might get. I mean, a Calgary pastor arrested uh, in Calgary as well, Tim Stevens, arrested yesterday afternoon from Fairview Baptist Church for failing to comply with public health measures after hosting another service without proper mask use, capacity limits, no physical distancing, obviously. Um, Calgary police saying they arrested him following the service in the church. Um, you know, it violated public health measures, a preemptive injunction. Last weekend, he was served a copy of the Court of Queen's Bench order, uh, which was obtained by Alberta Health Services to target organizers of gatherings in breach of health rules. So so now you've got, I think it's now at, at this count, three pastors in Alberta that have been uh, arrested recently. And, and, and some people are talking about, you know, how this is like a clampdown on Christianity or something like this, or how this is an attack on, on people of faith. I, I saw a great tweet from a, a political scientist, uh, Do- Dr. Dwayne Bratt. Most people know Dr. Bratt out of Mount Royal University. And, and he said this yesterday after that pastor's arrest, the fact that you can name three Christian preachers, um, Coates, Pavlovsky, and Stevens, uh, arrested for violating Alberta's COVID restrictions does not mean a crackdown on Christianity. He says there are tens of thousands of Christian ministers, he says, as well as priests and rabbis and imams and and others that are following the rules, uh, which I think is an important and good point. We got an email from a guy named Cam, and this was wild. And and Cam and I will continue to correspond 
behind the scenes, he says, I found out a few days ago that the reason that my entire family contracted COVID was because my mom attended a church service at Southside Victory Church in Calgary. He says, I watched the YouTube video of the Good Friday service and I just about threw up. Long to short, this is a church of the Grace Baptist brand, full unmasked attendance, far right fringe preaching, anti everything from the pulpit, says Cam, I am as angry as I have ever been in my entire life. He says this church that's been fined several times and doesn't give a rip has now gone to online services only. And I have to believe that there's been a major outbreak and that their congregates are dying and filling hospital beds. All of this to say, I'm out for blood to expose this. That from Cam. You can imagine the emotions that somebody like Cam might be feeling because a family member attended a church service along these lines and ended up introducing COVID-19 to their entire family. I think it's really unfortunate that, uh, I mean, my thoughts go out to Cam and his family, I just think it's really unfortunate that Christianity is getting hijacked. Um, it's getting hijacked for a, f- a few folks. Um, I mean, the word fringe was used earlier, and this does not actually, you know, represent the majority of Christianity in the province. Yeah, we've and we've had those conversations with with even with ministers in past, right? I think of I think of some of them that, that have joined us on the show, uh, Reverend Anna Greenwood Lee, Pastor Greg Hohalter, and others that have that have come forward and said, Here, here's what our brand of faith looks like, and here's what it means to, to gather in community and hear, and hear all these things. So, I, I mean, zero sympathy for people getting arrested right now. As a matter of fact, I think that the general population's uh, quite ready to see some of these arrests happen, especially as, I mean, but hey, there's also some good news on the, on the, on the case numbers front. If you look across Canada, jurisdictions across Canada, cases are starting to come down, which is a good thing. Reason for optimism there, to be sure. We're going to get into our question of the week coming up in just a second. We asked you last week, who do you trust? Uh, some pretty interesting trends and some pretty interesting responses. Plus, we want to leave some time to get to your emails to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We have some great emails following our Ethics of Eating uh, show. Last Thursday, we talked about uh, you know veganism and, and, and eating meat and sustainable ranching and um, uh, you know humane slaughter, if there's such a thing, and, and hunting and all kinds of things. And we got a, a bunch of really thoughtful takes um, which I really appreciate. I want to get to those. And then, of course, our conversation uh, about Israel and Palestine on Friday, um, which is really the first segment that we've had on the show, really, really getting into this. And we have several more to come, in, uh, including some wheels in motion on some pretty high profile guests that we're working on trying to get them for this week. I've learned in this business, you don't typically want to go on the record talking about who you're trying to get, because if you don't get them, then then you look like you can't get guests. But I'll tell you. Um, for those of you that are saying, well, where's the other side of the story? Why aren't you telling the other side of the story? We'll just sort of remind you how shows like this operate. You know, someone said you didn't cover. There are a lot of things you didn't get to in your roundtable. I said to a buddy over the weekend, imagine that, that in 20 minutes, we, we didn't manage to solve the entire crisis of violence in the Middle East. We didn't, we didn't manage to bring Israel and Palestine together and, and find peace and unity in a way that no American president has really ever been able to do. Uh, Real talk will continue. I don't mean to make light of it, but uh, of course we will continue our coverage of this. Of course we will speak to people from different perspectives. Of course we will continue to explore and investigate that, but I still want to leave some time to read some of your emails uh, just to give a sense of where the temperature's at on this and give the sense of of how people are feeling about this. Uh, We want to remind you that the team uh, at at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge, I just had a chance to swing by St. Albert Dodge over, over the past couple of days and the new Jeep lineup, I'll tell you, it's going to be on my Instagram story later today. There's a couple rigs in there that I'm just drooling over. I got to see the new, the, the new fully electric, not fully electric. That's not true. But, but the EV, the Jeep Wrangler EV. Ooh, I oh, want to know more about oh, this. Oh yeah. I'm going to post a video of it on my Instagram story this afternoon. And it's it's it looks really great. It's like your classic Wrangler. It's like got, got all the, you know, sort of like the square boxy kind of a look that everybody loves. And then it just has this this little kind of a thing on the side that almost looks like where you'd you'd put the gas in, but it's in the front. And of course, it's that it's that electric, what do you call it? Like an inlet, an outlet, whatever you the call plug it. In where you the plug, plug in, in the plug. Yeah. Whatever yeah. you want to call it, the plug. Um and, and you kind of go, really? On a Jeep Wrangler? So I'm like, can I take it for a bit of a spin? 
By the way, love getting behind the wheel of something that has like nine kilometers on it. You're always like, oh, I'm like, you're going to like run it into a pole or something or like mess it up. You can't even hear it. It's like, it's wild. It's absolutely wild. Now, I don't know if you can get your hands on it or not. I don't know if it's already sold. What I do know is the team at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge have the best Jeep selection in the entire province. Go ahead and see them today. Also, big shout out to the team at Friesen Brothers. I, I was talking to a guy yesterday, stopped me on the sidewalk, we were walking the dog yesterday afternoon, and he goes, how come you never talk about the frozen stuffed potato skins at Friesen Brothers? I was like, oh, I, I, tell me more. And so we're sitting there, me and this fella, and he's going, oh my gosh. I said, well, does Friesen Brothers make them? Do they make them in-house? He goes, I don't know. He goes, you don't know about these? I was like, well, I'm going to have to obviously figure them out. I'm going to have to obviously learn a bit more. He says, he, this guy's Kyle. He's telling me he does them on his barbecue. He goes, you're going to blow people's minds. He goes, you have to tell people to check out the frozen potato skins at Friesen Brothers. I said, well, I will, Kyle. And then I'll remind him that Friesen Brothers has 15 locations across Alberta. And for more than 65 years, they've been Alberta grown and Alberta owned. You can find the link to their website under the sponsors tab on ours. By the way, yeah, feel free to, you know, submit your favorite grocery items that you pick up at Friesen Brothers. We'd love to hear from you. Let's get to this, our question of the week. This is really fascinating stuff. As you know, we partner with the team at Y Station every week. Uh, the new question's up this week at ryanjesperson.com. We, we thank the, uh, what was it, 900 plus of you, 923 of you last week that went ahead and answered our question. We wanted to know, who do you trust? And some really interesting results. We're going to get into this. We, we measured trust. We reported it as a percentage of people who expressed a high level of trust. So not the average trust that people felt. So so some of the trends were pretty evident here. Were pretty obvious. Uh, you don't trust politicians. Uh, you you really lack trust in politicians. You don't really trust celebrities. Um, and we'll get to this in just a second, but but Joe Rogan and, and Gwyneth Paltrow and Jake Paul and, and Tucker Carlson scored really, really low. Who do you trust? You trust your best friend, 92%. Your close friends, 85 Sir, if you're digging through this, did you happen to notice that people trust their friends more than their family? This is pretty fascinating. Yeah, friends were right up at the tippy top. 92%. Best friend scores 92%, mom scores 71%, siblings 69%, and dad 66%. Dads. You trust mom more than you trust dad, which is fascinating stuff. Now, when it came to where you place a high level of trust, it's not with politicians, as mentioned. But let's look at this. 63% trust the dog. 25% trust the cat. You trust your dog way more than you trust your cat. And I've heard people joke about this before, that, that even people that, that love their cats do believe to a certain degree at some point the cat might kill them in their sleep. Absolutely. Yep. you got to be on you never believe that. You never believe that about your dog, do you? No. I mean, unless, you, unless there's something going on. Grandparents did not score as high as we would think. It's absolutely bizarre. 46, grandma gets 46%. Grandpa gets 39%. In other words, you trust your dog twice as much as you trust your grandfather. And 13%. This all checks out to me. 13% trust other pets. In other words, so that, that concerns me because if it's like a, a, a other pet, what's an other pet? I mean, you know, now, now the bird lobby, the rabbit lobby is mm -hmm. going to get in touch with me. You know, big chinchilla <laughs> is going to, is gonna, the lobby is going to get into, what do you mean other pets? I, I'm thinking if you have a boa constrictor, a python, and there's only 13% trust, these are real issues. Sam, you say this all checks out. What, what checks out here? You, it seemed to resonate with you that nobody trusts grandpa. Is there something going on? You know, okay. You know what? That one, uh, that one threw me for a loop. I, I thought grandparents would score higher than parents. Yeah. I feel like, uh, like, you know what I mean? It's just like the, the, throughout our lives, our, our grandparents are the source of wisdom. So, you know, I, I always thought like grandparents would yeah, score higher than parents. I was surprised I, at that. I think like maybe it's a, you know, they're, they're a couple generations removed from us. So they're a little bit less in touch with what we care about. Like, I think that that's something that I kind of gleaned off of that a but little does bit. That but reflect, yeah. does that reflect on trust? Oh, that's just it. I mean, it's like trust is an entirely different thing. Yeah. So, so when we asked who do you trust the most of any profession, 
I can't ask either of you because I know you've seen the answers. I know you've seen the stats. You've seen how it all plays out. So have our Patreon supporters. They all got exclusive access to the top line report from Y Station. They get it every Sunday night, Monday morning when it comes out. The profession you trust the most, Real Talkers, 93% of you trust nurses. Who do you trust the least? (laughs) This is amazing considering the source. Politicians and advertising executives. That's who you trust the least, politicians and advertising executives. We can actually take a look here, Sam. I'll put this graphic up on my screen. So 93% nurses. And then we've got kind of a bit of a log jam at the top in a good way. If you're a pharmacist, if you're a doctor, if you're a firefighter, if you're a teacher, if you're a researcher, generally speaking, people trust you. Professors have 73% trust, which is kind of interesting, although I'm not sure that's completely surprising considering, you know, some of the conversations around, you know, is there bias in universities or do people believe in in objectivity of professors and things like that? I mean, 73%. I mean, if a politician had 73% approval, they'd be thrilled. So 73% is either good or bad, depending on how you look at it. 57. I don't even know how this profession wound up on the list, but it's great. 57% trust boat captains. Journalists. Have trust issues right now, 48% trust. Police officers, 44. Loggers, 31%. And then it goes down from there. Lawyers, 25. Consultants, bankers, only one in five of you trust your banker. 8% trust CEOs. I mean, these are these are tough stats. If you're an executive, if you're a politician, it, it, it may not be news to you. How about this for a mind blower? More than 900 people chimed in. Rachel Notley, leader of Alberta's official opposition. We asked you about Jason Kenney and Rachel Notley. Rachel Notley's level of trust is higher in Calgary than it is in Edmonton. She scored a 78% in Calgary. She scored a 77% in Edmonton. Mind blowing. Right? If you were if you were to prognosticate or if you were to, to believe what you'd hear from, from politicians who would oppose her... Um, you would you would speculate potentially that she'd score in the in the teens in Calgary, 78 percent trust in Calgary. What about this? When it comes to public figures, a trust level out of 10. Rachel Notley scored a 75 percent with those respondents to our survey. Barack Obama, 72 is popular. Dr. Teresa Tam, Canada's uh, I always call her the chief medical officer of health. That's not actually her title, but um, the big cheese basically on public health in Canada. Ned Ninchy, Don Iveson score all right, mid 60s. Joe Biden, 55. Joe Biden pulls like almost 20% below his, his predecessor uh, on the Democratic side, Barack Obama, which is interesting. John Oliver, 54. Bernie Sanders is trusted less, just barely by a percent, than Joe Biden. Dan Rather, 50%, which is kind of an interesting one there. Remember, Dan Rather, a, a long and storied career in journalism, and, the, and then he had that that one story about George W. Bush and the Air Force and everything blew up. And and now Dan Rather is one of my favorite follows on Twitter. He's actually unbelievable there. Public figures, how much do you trust the queen? 44%. I wonder if trust issue around the queen. I mean... Well, did you see the interview with uh, Meghan Markle? Come on. Yeah, but... Come on. Yeah, I mean, think of all the, you know, think of everything that the Queens had to deal with. I mean, over the course of of her tenure, what a wild ride it would be to be the Queen of England over the past 60 years or so. Absolutely. I mean, there has been a lot, but um, I... We should, uh, well, here's the thing. I mean, if you want to bring that, so 44% (laughs) trust the Queen, 24% trust Meghan Markle. So that's pretty interesting. Ding, ding, dong. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, 44%. There's some real trust issues there. The prime minister's got some real trust issues, 43%. Oprah, 36 I don't know if that's maybe because of Oprah's ties to like Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz and, right? I think that might be it. Uh, Bill Gates, 31%. Interesting story surfacing over the weekend. Yeah. Right. An alleged affair about 20 years ago with a, you know, an employee or some sort of a uh, connection at Microsoft, which now is sort of the resignation from the board and maybe the divorce from Melinda and everything, maybe making a bit more sense. Edward Snowden, only 24% trust, which is wild. I wonder what that would have looked like had we asked that five years ago or three years ago. I don't know how it would have gone in either way. Bill Clinton, nobody trusts Bill Clinton, 13%. And then it gets into the really, this is what kind of, (laughs) I mean, it's strange because you've got a lot of celebrities and then you have a couple conservative politicians 
slot it in there. But th- this would be right around the the bottom of the. I mean, this is this is sort of who scored the the worst. Joe Rogan at six percent. I have to think that's influenced in part based on his recent comments about young people getting vaccinated. That's still fresh. And when when you answer a question like, who do you trust? And then somebody asks you a specific name. You're probably going to, at at least to some degree, be influenced by recent news you've heard about that person, wouldn't you think? Well, absolutely. I think. But I mean, that's the most up to date information you have on a person. So uh, the fact that he said just, you know. Work out, work out, and you'll. I'm yeah. paraphrasing, but work out, and you'll you'll be fine. But like the biggest, no vaccine necessary. Literally the biggest podcast in the world. So when he's when he's saying stuff like that, it's kind of like, Doctor Phil five percent, Doctor Oz three percent. Has Doctor Oz fallen out of favor? I wonder. I mean, would Doctor Oz have pulled at sixty percent three years ago or seventy five percent? I mean, I can think of people citing Doctor Oz ad nauseum. Well, when he was with Oprah, because I mean, when she was still on the air, he was brought on as an expert yeah. and elevated. So then it seemed like he was a little bit more reputable. And then afterwards, he got his own show, right? And um, he's just some of the wild things that he's claimed. It's uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, two <laughs> percent. Goop. It yeah. reminds me of I and I was excited for I was excited for Professor Timothy Caulfield to see this one. The author of Is Gwyneth Paltrow Wrong About Everything, uh, which is a great book worth your time. Uh, conservative leader, federal conservative leader Aaron O'Toole at three percent. Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook at two percent. Premier of Alberta, Jason Kenney, earning a one percent here from the more than 900 respondents to the survey. Tucker Carlson of Fox, 1%. Jake Paul, the whatever, however you describe Jake Paul. He's like, I understood him to be sort of a YouTube personality. Now it seems like he's fighting everybody for money. I don't really understand. Evander Kane, I see, of the San Jose Sharks is is the guy that's that's most recent to get in line to fight Jake Paul. We asked, who do you trust to keep your secrets? And, and I love these, the fill in the blank ones. One of you said my pen and paper notebook that I burn, that I can burn when I've written my thoughts down. Interesting. Another says I only trust myself. Two can keep a secret if one of them is dead. Another says it depends on the secret. Secrets from the past that no longer pose any danger to myself or my family only trusted with anyone uh, within arm's length of that secret. Secrets with potential future damage are not shared with anyone. Goes on to say different friends have different types of trust. One friend I trust with things emotional. Another friend holds my trust for physical secrets, but is useless on an emotional level. The big kaboom secret, says this audience member, is mine alone. Another one of you says you only trust me. I appreciate that. Another says I trust doctors, nurses, grocery store workers, custodians, and any other frontline worker. Goes on to say I am a a teacher myself, so I already had trust in that profession. Another says my husband earned my trust a long time ago and has reinforced my feelings throughout COVID, which is great. Another says, uh, wrote in, you trust Corb Lund, which is great. The singer songwriter who's been on this show a couple of times. Who's someone who's lost your trust in the last two years when you said pick any politician? Another says, get this. This is interesting. When you said my mortgage broker because they've been posting anti-Trudeau memes and harassing well-meaning folks online, a business acquaintance promoting COVID hoax links on social media. I think some people are doing more damage to their professional reputation than they realize. Another one of you says it's a bummer, but I lost a really good friend this past year who just proved to be unreliable way too many times. There's only so many times you can get let down. Another says, earmuffs kids, I'm going to read this one, says, I've lost trust in humanity in general. I thought we cared about each other, but it turns out people are assholes and and care more about their freedoms over the health and well-being of others. This pandemic has brought out the worst of humanity, and it scares me where we go from here. Another says, the the biggest loss of trust came to me from leaving religion, the religion I was raised in. It was a real kick in the teeth. One of the people I thought were my friends were actually not friends at all. It's next level difficult to try to make real lasting friendships in your 30s. I'm doing my best to keep hope. And another says, let's stop blindly trusting in the nobility of certain professions. It's probably a fair comment. There are doctors, nurses, police officers, teachers who are also sociopaths. 
just as there are vile lawyers, politicians, loggers, and bureaucrats. I do believe that there are some professions that tend to attract people with personality disorders like politics, but there are genuinely decent people in all walks of life. That one seems to resonate with you, Sarah. Well, I was about to say, wait, 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 (laughs) wait. But I liked that little, you know, asterisk of certain professions draw and attract certain types of folks. So someone that, you know, needs to have their ego uh, stroked every once in a while or every moment of every day. (laughs) Yeah. Our question of the week this week, you can find it on our homepage. Uh, We can find ryanjesperson.com just just right at the top. Question of the week in partnership with our official research and strategy partner. Uh, We're asking, you know, it seems like there's, there's never a slow day in Alberta politics. Uh, Last week, we saw members of the United Conservative Party caucus step basically into the light and openly call for the premier's resignation. This following an open letter from uh, 16, then 17 MLAs criticizing his increased Kenny's increased public health measures after the Easter long weekend. We're asking you to weigh in on Premier Jason Kenny's political prognosis, the future leader of the United Conservatives and their prospects for the next election. Uh, So it says, as you can see on our website right here, we are asking you to predict the political future. Takes two or three minutes to fill out. We'd love to see more than a thousand of you chime in on this. It's our question of the week presented by the team at Y Station. Uh, Before we get on with our first interview today, I wanted to remind you that you can uh, you can save money and breathe easy by right now taking the two minutes to sign yourself up at Clean Air Club. .ca. Your furnace filter needs to be changed. We know that, but oftentimes it's, it's the one thing that keeps getting bumped. It keeps getting kicked down the road because everything else demands our attention. We know how the to-do list works. All you do on the website, you give them the size of the furnace filter you need, and then you just wait. Sometimes you wait for less than a day. Sometimes it takes a day, and then all of a sudden your replacement furnace filters are at your front step delivered for less than you'll pay in the big box store You can save money, breathe easy, do your family a favor at cleanairclub.ca. Sam, can you show me that Instagram post, that Park Power Instagram post? I wanted to show you this. I'm always talking about their social media. You know, Park Power powers our Real Talk RJ hashtag on Twitter. Look at this, electrical safety. They've got tips on how to protect your family, how to protect your property from threats like fire. Park Power's service in this regard goes so much further than simply providing electricity, internet, and natural gas. Give them a follow on social media. And while you're checking out their website, parkpower.ca, if you want to bring your business over there, remember the promo code 2021-REALTALK gets you $70 off your first bill, commercial or residential, again, at parkpower.ca. Well, I wanted to to get to this story. Uh, we'll tee it off uh, with with an email from Joan who wrote into the show just on Friday. Uh, wheels were already in motion on the segment, which is great. Joan said, you know, I've been listening to Real Talk since the very start, and I really appreciate the range of topics and the diversity of your guests. Your coverage of the, the many facets of the pandemic have been far reaching, in particular, your coverage on how management of the pandemic has shone a light on many societal inequities. Joan says we need much greater public awareness on these issues. These are members of our community who have been entirely overlooked, including temporary foreign workers who come to Alberta to work on our farms, to help staff our greenhouse operations. There there are approximately 3,000 of these hardworking people living among us. They provide essential labor to ensure that our food supply needs are met. They come from Mexico, Latin America, the Caribbean, to do the heavy labor, which Canadian-born folks refuse to do. They come to Canada legally. They provide essential services, but due to numerous barriers, they have virtually no access to the vaccine. Alberta Health has done nothing to ensure that these workers who live in congregant housing, some of which is substandard, are protected against the pandemic. They're highly vulnerable as they are beholden to their employers. They must work and live under their direction. The farms that they work at are often isolated, They have virtually no access to transportation to get to things like vaccination centers. Oftentimes, they don't speak English, further compounding the marginalization they can face. Like everybody else, these folks are entitled to get the vaccine but face so many barriers, they simply cannot. It's entirely unacceptable that these temporary foreign workers are good enough to do the work that sustains us but cannot access life-saving services. These conditions must stop. 
That from Joan, who wrote in to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Well, I'm grateful that Vanessa Ortiz has agreed to join us this morning from the Association of Mexicans in Calgary, alongside an individual that has experience working as a migrant farm worker, a fellow by the name of Clyde. Uh, We're going to get to both of them in just a second. The Association of Mexicans in Calgary recently uh, publishing a letter to the province, to the premier. And among that, the, the, the demands, or maybe we'll call them the asks, they want to see priority for farm workers in the vaccination rollout. They want to see better access here. In other words, information provided in their languages and their vaccines and transportation as well. Migrant farm workers face mobility barriers, as you read in Joan's letter. Vanessa Ortiz joining us this morning from the Association of Mexicans in Calgary. Vanessa, thank you so much for being here. We we appreciate your availability this morning on on Real Talk. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm just trying to buy some time here. We're obviously having a bit of an issue uh, lining up our guests here. Sam, what's going on? Are we good to go? We're good to go. Okay, let's get Vanessa Ortiz up as soon as possible. Um, Vanessa, good morning and welcome to the show. Hi, good morning. So this, I'm sure you had an opportunity to hear Joan's letter there, um, which I think sets the scene for a pretty important conversation. Um, I th- because first of all, uh, let's be honest, this is going to be the first time a-, a lot of ordinary people are even hearing about this. How much of an issue is this? It's a great issue, Ryan. Uh, we've been working um, with this community since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, but we've known about the issue for many, many years. Uh, we are part of a network. Uh, we are collaborating with and we are being mentored by Justicia for Migrant Workers, who have done an amazing job in Ontario addressing this issue. And we also collaborate with Migrant Rights uh, Network, also based in Ontario. Um, in Alberta, there are around 25 hundred workers to 3,000 workers uh, who are growing our food, growing the flowers we give out on Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, uh, or Halloween pumpkins. I've seen it with my own eyes. That's their work. Um, and, And they are facing enormous systemic barriers to access several services. And right now our Biggest concern is the COVID nineteen vaccine. So has this has this been obviously we're talking about this in the context of a pandemic and in the context of vaccines, but am I safe to speculate that in the bigger picture, maybe access to things like health services or other supports has been a long standing issue for these people? It has always been an issue. This program, it's called the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program, started in 1966 and for Mexican workers in 1972. Um, And it was meant to supply um, the demand of of agricultural workers in Canada. It was supposed to be temporary, but of course it became very profitable because they are uh, being paid uh, minimum wage. They are working long hours with no overtime payment. They don't have access to many of the uh, labor rights that uh, other workers do. And uh, they have issues with uh, dignified living, dignified housing, uh, a dignified workplace, uh, being treated with respect by employers. This is something we see on a daily basis. And so it covers a range. There's a there's a there's a wide range of issues they face on a daily basis. Has there been as as far as you know, uh, with regards to to your advocacy and your organization, Association of Mexicans in Calgary, um, has there has there been uh, in past avenues for advocacy? H- have people been speaking up for these workers uh, or, or is this a relatively new development? It is for Alberta. Um, in Alberta, there is uh, one organization that has always been fighting for temporary foreign workers, undocumented folks and other uh, people with precarious immigration status. Uh, it's Migrante Alberta and we are collaborating hand in hand with them, but specifically related to farm workers and um, having outreach community outreach with farm workers, which entails visiting them, bringing them supplies, connecting with them through different um, through different means. Uh, that's um, we haven't found another organization that has done it before us. So you write you write this letter uh, to the premier. Uh, you, I mean, you see, see basically the who's who of his cabinet, right? The, the minister of health, the minister of labor and immigration, minister of agriculture and forestry, chief medical officer of health, minister of health, federal uh, Honorable Patty Haidu, Federal Minister of Agriculture, Federal Minister of, of, of Employment. I mean, this is the who's who of influencers and of people who could act on this. The letter was dated May 3rd. Have you heard back from anybody on this? 
we have not. And we actually sent it in April the 24th, and we had a second attempt on May the 3rd, ah. hoping that it was missed in their emails. But unfortunately, we haven't heard back. We are extremely disappointed by lack of response. It is very irresponsible that this issue is not being taken care of because these, they, they, these workers live in congregate facilities. Uh, sometimes you have 12 workers in the same house, four workers in the same room. We have seen the rooms. We know where they live. And um, it's extremely irresponsible. Um, in addition to the fact that they are frontline workers, essential workers that are contributing to our food supply chain, they are literally feeding all of us and uh, they are very invisible. What's the what's the sense you get? And, and, and we want to recognize that a fellow by the name of, of Clyde had agreed to join us. I think it's just technical difficulties, the reason why we don't have them, which is really unfortunate, because let me say, let me credit him for for having the courage. He was willing to put his face here and to, to speak to this. Um, as far as you can tell, what's the general consensus? I mean, let, let me acknowledge I'm asking you to speak on behalf of thousands of people here. But but generally speaking, uh, what sense do you get about about how these workers are feeling about about the lack of protections, the, the, the lack of resources? Resources. Do, do they feel betrayed? Do they? What, what sense do you get? They feel abandonment and isolation. Uh, they know that the, their work that they're very proud of, and it's a work that they do with a lot of pride. Um, I've seen the work that they do when they grow flowers and they are real artists, like every arrangement you see in Christmas and uh, Mother's Day, that's their work, right? And they're very proud of it as they should be. But they know that the Canadian society is not valuing their work and they know that th this lack of services, this lack of access for services, it's a reflection of of that, of how they're not valued. Uh, we've talked to many of them. We have a network of around 200 uh, workers, which is less than 10% uh, of workers in the province. But yet again, it's really difficult to reach out to these communities because they are in the most isolated areas of Alberta. But we know that they want the vaccine. They are really worried about not getting it on time. They're worried about going back home without the vaccine and then the Canadian government asking for the vaccine next year when they want to come back and work for the next season. So that's what we've been hearing. So, uh, well, first of all, I mean, let me say I'm not, I don't always ask questions in order of importance. And so I don't want to indicate that, that that the health of the ag industry is more important than the lives of people. But but let me ask you, based on what you just said, can you see this being somewhat of a retention or a recruitment problem down the line? Can you see something like this, this message resonating among people that could come to Canada to work and that may decide against it? What do you think the industry implications could be here? It's huge. Absolutely. We saw it at the beginning of January when the federal government implemented this requirement to travel, which was the uh, negative COVID test. Uh, this was a huge barrier for many of them. Many could not, could not pay for that test because it's a private test. But this is something that it's paid privately in Mexico, for example, and it's worth $200, $300, which is unattainable for many. So this was a huge barrier. We, we asked the federal government to collaborate with employers and with provincial governments to cover these expenses because this is a huge expense. Some of them had to take it twice because they it came back uh, negative the first time, sorry, positive the first time, which was a false positive, and then it, they had to wait and it came back negative. So many of them didn't come this year because of this requirement. Many of them uh, came and are already in debt because of this expense, which might not seem like a lot for, for many people, but for them, it's a huge sacrifice. Um, and so absolutely, I can see it as a, I can see it as a huge barrier next year for them to come. We saw it in Ontario as well, where uh, there were outbreaks in the farms and employers had to start um, employing people from the community, um, you know, white Canadians, uh, non-racialized Canadians. And they were offering instead of uh, $15, which is what uh, farm workers are paid per hour, they were offering um, uh, people born in Canada $25 an hour. So we know that all of this uh, restrictions that they face, all of the systemic barriers actually allow for the Canadian market to have low prices in their vegetables, in their fruit, in their flowers, in their honey. Uh, which is the work they do so we we can absolutely see this coming do you, i'm i'm seeing i mean in our live chat we get interesting feedback on a number of stories and i'm seeing a word pop up a recurring word in the live chat today and that is exploitation 
and people are talking about Canada's temporary foreign worker program, talking about how it's 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 been much aligned uh, maligned over the years. Um, you know, Nadine says the entire program is a joke. You know, so many workers are taken advantage of. Terry says we like to think we don't, but Canada does exploit workers. Kelly Joe says this is straight up exploitation. Does the word fit? Absolutely. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, th- these workers aren't even considered temporary. They're considered seasonal. Can you can you clarify? What's the difference? Uh, well, the difference is that they come for contracts of eight months a year. And I believe uh, to be temp- considered uh, temporary, you need to be here for longer in uh-huh. a year. And um, they're hired seasonally, so they don't have access to many, many uh, workers' rights. For example, in Alberta, um, there is a huge issue because they are not allowed to be unionized. So they are not represented in any way. Um, they, uh, for many years, they didn't have access to occupational health and safety standards to workers' compensation board. Um, and they will never have the opportunity to apply for permanent residency under the program because they're considered seasonal. It's a technicality in their in their uh, immigration status that means a lot to them and their families because they face family separation every single year. We know personally, we know workers that have been coming for 20, 22, 25 years to this program for eight months a year, and they are still not qualifying for permanent residency. They have been away from their families for 25 years. Okay, so I... I already know some of the messages I'm going to receive after this conversation. And I'm going to ask you about what should fall on the employer here and, and, and who you think should maybe balance some of the, I mean, you know, you're asking for, you know, transportation to be provided for, for essentially paid leave to be provided. So these workers can get vaccinated, et cetera. Um, we're talking about living conditions, cramped quarters. And I want to ask you about all this, but, but I guarantee, and you know it too, that, that employers that, that, Farmers that ag producers are going to write in and say, "What do you what do you think our margins look like? You seriously like what, what do you think that we can afford to build big hotels? You think we can give a bunch of days off? There's there's financial realities. This would bury our farms. I mean, if I want to go really big picture, we could talk about the NDP's Bill Six back in the day that that endeavored to provide farm worker protection. And look at the pushback on that, um, which I'll admit and I'll acknowledge. I'll try not to get off in a rabbit hole here, but it was communicated poorly. The consultation was was piss poor, quite frankly, but it was quite ironic for me to see so many people working in ag pushing back against protections for people working in ag. I need a full hour to ruminate on that after we say thank you to you. But where do you think that the employer should fit into the mix here? And and how do you see that going? I think they need supports from the federal government and provincial government. We, uh, we have never in our work considered this, um, something between bad employers and good employers. This is systemic and we understand that it's systemic and there are three levels of government involved. And most of the times uh, th- the th- three levels are sending you know, the ball to each other in terms of responsibilities. We know that the federal government is responsible for immigration. The provincial government is responsible for labor and health and the municipal government is uh, should be uh, doing supervisions for housing. So this is the complexity of of uh, the work we do is that we have to navigate those three levels of government. And many of the times uh, these communities are so invisible that they will never receive attention from either or. Uh, we have filed several ESCC complaints, which are complaints to Service Canada around treatment for for workers when we have never heard back so uh, I think uh, the more people are aware of this the more we will be able to address these issues effectively because these workers have no access to community connections and we understand that COVID has been really hard on on, on, on some employers we understand but we also know that this was the perfect excuse to keep them confined We know of workers that spend months without leaving the farm. They also have no permission to receive visitors. Uh, Some of the farms have even have cameras, surveillance cameras to make sure the the, the farm workers don't leave the farm. Um, and, And we know that some farmers have made the effort to vaccinate their workers, but that is not the answer. This is a very uneven response of of something that should be dealt with systemically, something that should be coming from institutions from Alberta from Alberta Health. So in terms of vaccinations, we feel that the provincial government has been unresponsive 
has been trying to close their eyes um, in front of this. And we think that they need to sit together, employers and provincial government, and figure out a way to provide these folks uh, access to dignified vaccination and dignified health care. Mark's watching in from Utah right now. He says this is very much exploitation, says employers are able to take advantage of of these workers' willingness to accept relatively low wages because the wages in their home countries are even lower and jobs are scarce. Fatima says, I'm surprised anybody's surprised that Canada's exploiting these workers. Canada has a rich history of taking advantage of and exploiting brown bodies. It's part of our systemic policy. Terry says, I didn't know about any of this, and I'm just furious um, she says that employers and our government, where do you see this going? I mean, oftentimes public opinions, big, right. And grassroots movements are big. Uh, it's notable that you've sent two letters and haven't heard back from anybody. And we're talking about across party lines. Let's note as well. You're talking about a conservative provincial government, a liberal federal government. Um, what does that say to you? And, and ultimately what's your call to action here? Well, we need we need folks to make calls and to email your representatives because they are not listening to us. And we know that many, many times if they see an email coming from the Mexican community, they might not hear about it. They might they might they might ignore it. We know that our voice has less power because we're racialized Canadians and and we need you guys. We need our allies and we need everyone on board, everyone who believes in dignified uh, living conditions for workers and uh, workers' rights uh, to email your representatives to make to make those calls to write letters to the editor of different newspapers because we need to get this word out. And um, we know uh, for a fact that other provinces had made it work. Ontario has has made it work. Um, they are even implementing a pilot project in the at the airport where they are vaccinating those who are willing to vac- get vaccinated at the airport. They have also had in in British Columbia they had mobile clinics, pop up clinics at the farms because some of them are huge farms with 80, 100 workers. Um, we just heard from a farm yesterday they employ 90 workers none of them have been vaccinated but guess what there are Canadian employees who come in and out of the farm and uh, they have been vaccinated because they have access to they don't have a language barrier they can make their own appointments they have access to transportation and these are all things that these workers don't have and they are really frustrated at the fact that they might never get it okay but we need we need so, your voices, basically. But you're saying that it's doable. I mean, you're, you're, you're saying, for example, at least to a certain degree, that Ontario has been able to roll out a model that sounds to me is at least somewhat uh, addressing the issue. Yes, it is doable. It is possible. It just needs political will. Uh, political will. We need we need politicians to get on this. Uh, these this these people rely. These people are trust. These people trust the Canadian government to come in here and do the work for eight months and leave their families behind for eight months and sacrifice the level of personal and and, and family sacrifice that they make. It's huge. And so the least we can do uh, is to provide this uh, access to health care for them. We we need to do better as a society in looking out for those who are who are putting food on our table. You know, you said something, Vanessa, before I thank you for your time, you said something there that I don't want to just breeze by and I don't want to just go, oh yeah, and then just ask my next question. You said as, as racialized people, um, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember your exact statement, but basically it's tough, to, it's tough to catch people's attention. It's tough to get the message out. It's tough to get people to care is essentially what you're implying. Can you tell us more about that? Even through your own experience, your own perspective, can, can, can you make some of us feel uncomfortable in a way that we need to feel? It is. Our organization, we started in 2018 and we started because as a Mexican community, we were facing racism in our communities and we had no protocol to uh, address uh, these hate incidents that we were being um, victim of. Uh, My own daughter, she was at her playground before school and an adult, a grown man came to her. She was 11 at that time, uh, said, said to her, you are not welcome here, go back to your country. This is not home, this is not Mexico, so go back. So I immediately thought, you know, this is something that the RCMP is gonna look into, but I faced so many barriers, accessing to justice for my child, protecting my 
my own child, uh, that I started looking out for families, looking for families that were experiencing the same incidents and that were facing institutional racism and systemic racism. And we found many in the Mexican community. We came together as an organization, but of course, when, when COVID-19 hit, we directed all of our energies towards protecting this, uh, this population of um, migrant farm workers who are facing even more systemic barriers than, than those of us who don't have uh, a precarious immigration status. So uh, the Mexican community is also facing systemic racism. We we need to be heard. We need to we need your support. Amplifying the messages we're providing you. Uh, we have put a lot of work into making these connections and these networks with the folks that we serve, which are the farm workers in rural Alberta that are in the most isolated, the remotest of the areas. And it is just now that we are able to grasp a little bit of attention. But it's really been it's been very difficult. It's a gaslighting experience to basically being a screaming at a void. These are workers. These are feeding all of us. They are working hard in rural Alberta, and you don't even you don't even notice them. You don't even know they exist. This is new for many people, and they've been here for forty plus years. So um, we need to we need to do better. We need to listen to racialized voices. We need to listen to grassroots organizations, and and we need to volunteer and support, and and most of all, amplify the messages we're giving you because. Uh, the messages we're giving you are genuine. They are coming from the community. We are consulting with them every single day. We are communicating with them every single day. And we will we never do anything without their permission or their consent. So uh, just amplifying those voices that are coming from the community. Thank you for this reality check, uh, Vanessa. Uh, on behalf of, of Albertans and Canadians, I'm grateful for your advocacy, and and I'm certainly um, appreciative of you putting this on our radar in a way that we can't ignore. Uh, Vanessa Ortiz of the Association of Mexicans in Calgary. You can find information on what they're doing by following the links on the tweet that I sent out right around 8 o'clock this morning. Thank you for this. Thank you, Ryan. You bet. Um, uh, paying attention to our live chat. I mean, it's it's uh, it, it's unbelievable, you know. I mean, I mean, let me let me get back to what Fatima was saying just about about racialized. I mean, along these themes of, of racialized people having a more difficult time even getting issues on the radar, you know. She says, you know, like just talking about you know people in positions of power. She says they don't listen to or read emails even from racialized names. If you have a white sounding name, you need to write a letter on a lot of issues says that's a hard but real truth. Tracy says, yeah, what about the simple fact that if we leave entire pockets of the province unvaccinated, it threatens the effectiveness of the COVID protocols in the rest of the province? How can people even ignore this? Arnold Palmer says it's not just Alberta's provincial government. The entire immigration system is about bringing money into Canada. We could balance the human side of this system better unseen stranger says and i know this will cause ripples says i guess i no longer trust agricultural producers even though i am one i'm not saying you can't trust agricultural producers but i do think that this is a really important issue and one that shouldn't be ignored when an agency or an organization organization like this um this isn't like like i understand if if you say you know i wrote an email to the premier and he never got back to me and it's like what do you say in your email well, I called him a real SOB and told him what I thought about him, and he, he didn't write me back. It's so weird. It's a little bit different when you have an advocacy organization that's that's writing out, you know, I mean, pretty compelling uh, information, painting a picture of a clear reality affecting thousands of people. It's estimated around 3,000 workers in Alberta alone. You know, not to mention however many there may be across the rest of the country. British Columbia's got a ton. Ontario's got a ton. I don't know much about Manitoba and Saskatchewan. I would imagine it's the same story there. I'm trying to think of, you know, prairie producing, crop producing jurisdictions. But of course, I'm sure that you could probably find um, examples where I would imagine that fisheries have a certain element of this on the East Coast. I don't know. But we're talking about this is an issue across Canada and they're not even getting a response and I, and I read the list on purpose of, of all the ministers, federally and provincially, that have received this correspondence that have yet to respond. I think that, boy, does that ever scream a loud message, doesn't it? Our thanks to uh, our guest for joining us. And, and we regret that we were unable to, to check in with, 
with the fellow that was uh, ready to go on the record. It just it just didn't work out technically. But but I want to recognize his courage and being willing to come forward and, and talk about it. You know how proud we are to be partnering with the team at Westworld Computers. They have a fully authorized Apple service department with trained technicians, more than 40 years of experience. This is a family-owned business. They can upgrade or fix any Apple product. They've seen it all. They've upgraded or fixed it all from your Mac, your iPad, even your Apple Watch or your iPhone. You can book your appointment for service at westworld.ca or you can give them a call. One of their trained Apple service advisors, happy to help. You can park right in front of the store and walk right in they've got all the covid protocols in place i've experienced it firsthand no more long lines and if you want to stay out of the mall you're looking to stay out of the mall right now for obvious reasons westworld's a good fit if you happen to be in the metro edmonton region while you're there ask about their apple trade-up program they give the highest values for your trade they'll even transfer your data to your new apple product in a complimentary fashion so you don't have to worry about it also, a big shout out to our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. We had a we had an audience member coming in from out of town over the weekend. They sent us an email and said, "Hey, which which are the locations? You always say Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. You know, with their dollar ninety nine peanut butter parfait, which is a wild price reduction. That's dropped the they've dropped the price by like two thirds." Right up until the end of the month of May, you have to mention Real Talk or Jespo, and they'll hook you up for a dollar ninety nine peanut butter parfaits. We're talking about the Dairy Queens that are family owned in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Wood, Sherwood Park, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. That's Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Sherwood Park, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. Those are the two in Sherwood Park. Shout out to our friends at Dairy Queen. Are we ready to rock with our next guest? Okay, I'm looking forward to that coming up in a few moments. Dr. Jennifer Mather will be joining us. uh, One of of the consultants, she was the scientific advisor on the Oscar-winning documentary, My Octopus Teacher. This is the doc that absolutely just blew my mind the other day. Uh, We're going to be talking to her in just a second. I'm curious to know how a psychology professor out of Lethbridge winds up working on a documentary about, what was it again, octopuses? Octopuses, not octopi? Octopuses. We endeavor to learn something new every single day, and Sarah Hoyles <laughs> is making that happen here as the producer of this show. We also take your emails every single day to talk at ryanjesperson.com, and, and it seems fitting, maybe following our conversation uh, after you know uh, talking about ag and, and food production, that we get to Eric's email. Eric was in touch right after Thursday's show where we talked about the the ethics of eating and, and hunting, and, and it was great conversations um, conversations that at, at some point were were relatively uh, uh, you know calm and measured, and at other points they, they they got a little heated, respectfully heated, and and I loved it. I was here on the edge of my seat, going, "Ooh boy!" Because people with all different kinds of opinions come to the table. Eric said, "Love the show." He said, "I, I wanted to respond to the idea that, that that one of your guests shot down on Thursday. Uh, in my opinion, it, it was lazy." Eric says, full disclosure, I'm a vegan. Leads me to one of my favorite jokes of all time. How do you know that? How how do you know that somebody's vegan? Don't worry, they'll tell you. But Eric says, no, I'm a vegan. (laughs) I love you, Eric. I'm just kidding, bud. He says, I believe is one of my truths that you cannot be against animal cruelty and still kill animals to eat their flesh. He says, I'm a, an Alberta born and raised guy who ate more than his fair share of meat in the past. Your guest, Ms. Scott Reed, Jessica Scott Reed, made a very valuable and salient point about whether we grow the animals ourselves or not. You know, when we end up still killing them, albeit quickly for food, the moral premise doesn't align. And in response, your other guest, Mr. Sanger, Jeff Sanger, uh, said that he hopes for the same kind of quick death When it's his time to go as well, you know, just the same sort of a death that his farmed animals receive. Eric says, I have consistently been confounded by the laziness of this argument, and I was surprised that it was used by somebody as well-spoken and as intelligent as Mr. Sanger clearly is. Eric says, yes, quick, swift action to end the suffering of a living thing is something I can get behind whether it is a human or not. The difference that is wholly ignored by Jeff's statement is that he will never face this situation and would likely never agree to being quickly killed in his prime health so that he could be consumed. 
The fact that he gains the animal's trust and love before slaughtering them does not help his case in my view either. Eric says, I got to a point where I could not shake or ignore the fact that sentience exists with the animals we slaughter and that any further involvement with valuing taste buds over sentimental life or rather sentient life would have me living hypocritically and opposite of what I truly believe to be right. He says, I have many, almost all, as a matter of fact, omnivorous friends, <laughs> and I am not one of those vegans that throws slaughterhouse images in your face while you're eating dinner. I just think that throwaway statements like the one that Mr. Sanger made devalues and undermines the serious place some people come from regarding this. That from Eric. And I totally appreciate you taking the time to send us that message, Eric. We don't read uh, emails because the show either agrees or disagrees with them, or we don't have a certain strategy when we read feedback. All we want to do is reflect where our audience is coming from and indicate how the, the thought process continues long after these interviews are done. And I don't know about you, but I certainly was, was given a lot to think about. Um, with those six panelists that joined us on Thursday. If you didn't have a chance to watch those shows, I encourage you to download the podcast or to check it out on YouTube. Um, some great conversations about about everything from, you know, what Eric's getting at and what Jeff and Jennifer were talking about with regards to abattoirs, slaughterhouses, and and, and that sort of angle, all the way through to hunting and, and, and hunting for sport versus hunting for food and hunting in North America versus hunting in Africa. And of course, our... Our conversation will continue on this, and we're very much looking forward to a special feature coming up that will focus more on indigenous traditions and food sustainability and, and culture there. And I have no doubt that that's going to be a great conversation. This was something that happened over the weekend, and I wanted to find a, a chance to, to bring this up. Uh, this, this was pretty troubling. Uh, we heard over the weekend that, that uh, fire rescue crews in our home city of, of Edmonton, Alberta, uh, were on scene at a, at, at a dog park, Terwilliger Dog Park. Crews uh, working, fire crews, to remove a dog that had been locked inside a vehicle. Um, per scanner chatter, uh, emergency scanner chatter, the dog had, had appeared to be in distress and was removed from the vehicle by fire personnel. The temperature at the time, 21 degrees outside. Well, it, it, it prompted this note, uh, which I appreciated. Uh, this is the Alberta Firefighters Association, and they had responded to the tweet that I sent about this. My tweet was pretty simple. I just said, be better, humans. Um, first of all, <laughs> I don't even know how you bring... I'm sure there's a story here, but you bring your dog to the dog park and you leave the dog in the car... I can't quite wrap my mind around that one. Um, but per the Alberta Firefighters Association, please don't leave your pets inside vehicles, they say. Animals are, are not able to sweat like humans do. And dogs cool themselves by panting and by sweating through their paws. And if they only have overheated air to breathe, animals can collapse, suffer brain damage, and possibly die of heat stroke, which in, in my mind might be one of the worst ways to go. Now, So, so here's here are some things. I always feel... I've always sort of been of the mind. It, it drives me nuts. Um, you know, you're watching like morning television, for example, and, and you've got the weather caster there and they say, you know, it's going to rain. So like, make sure you bring your umbrella or it's going to be minus 25. Make sure you wear a coat and you sit there and go, yeah, I think people are smart enough to figure it out. And then I'm reminded like over the weekend, people are not people do need reminders to not leave your kids in the car. People do need reminders to not drive to the dog park and leave your dog in the car. People do apparently need these reminders. And so in the spirit of, of a PSA, this is our public service announcement today on Real Talk. You know, here are some numbers to consider per the Alberta Firefighters uh, Association, the Firefighters Union. If it is 23.8 degrees, it's 24 degrees outside, a nice balmy spring into summer day, 24 degrees where you may not break a sweat inside your vehicle. It's probably double. It's probably 48 degrees degrees celsius inside the car once you get up to 25 degrees it jumps to 50 it virtually doubles as you can see if it's 32 degrees outside a beautiful day if you're in Kelowna, we don't need your bragging we don't need you to rub it in our faces we understand it's probably already 30 degrees every single day in freaking Kelowna. but if it's 32 degrees it's 61 and a half degrees celsius in your car 10 minutes 15 20 minutes 
I know I'm preaching to the choir. I know it sounds ridiculous that we have to keep talking about this, but people are still leaving their animals and their kids in the car. 10 minutes at 50 degrees is enough to put anybody into a really, really difficult and dangerous position. So please, I mean, Sarah, I don't know. You and I were kind of going back and forth. Like, do we lead with this? Do we talk about this today? I think it's worth mentioning. You know, we know we're going to see a couple of these stories through the summer. doesn't matter what city you're in, more than a couple. (laughs) And then the typical response you'll hear from people and I sort of feel the same way is that if I see that, I'm not sure I'm calling the fire department. I think the window's just coming out. Um, now people say, well, what are you doing? You advocating people vandalizing other people's cars. If there's a dog in distress, I, I'm not sure that I'm going to wait for the fire truck to get there. I just, this stuff drives me crazy. I think that's a really great, um, just like mental note is times it by two, double it. I've never actually seen it uh, broken down that way. Yeah. And so now I can say, yeah, if it's 25 degrees outside, it is 50 degrees in that car. I mean, I think the next step is, uh, yes, we need to remind folks, absolutely. But what kind of, um, you know, consequences are folks going to have if the fire department has to be called like this past weekend? Uh, This maybe, you know, there's animal cruelty when people are actually hurting animals the the rules and then you know the enforcement and the consequences for those folks are not that strict so would you know saying maybe maybe you need to pay this this substantial fine yeah maybe that would make it so someone would say okay i'm going to i'm going to be better or maybe i shouldn't have a dog or a rabbit or a chicken there's always going to be a story There's always going to be the story. The person that comes back to the car, uh, you you know, this would be a tough position to be in as well as the person that's like coming back from their walk and they see there's two fire trucks there and there's a, you know, a gaggle of people gathered around and giving the stink eye, given the the major stink eye and, uh, and and, and the dog's gone, right? The dog's in care of animal services and, and people are literally wanting to strangle you, uh, you know. We hear horrific stories. I read a a feature in the United States. I mean, I don't mean to sort of get into this too deeply because it's going to put me in a bad headspace. But, you know, about a dad whose whose infant died in the backseat of his car. He was just he was exhausted. Typically, his wife drove their little one to daycare, but it was his turn to drive and he went to work. But he was in his regular his mindset wasn't there and he was in his routine and he went to work and he went in. And he worked all day. I was, I, it took me like a long time to get through the story because I kept stuck. Because you picture your own kid. Absolutely. And this dad came out oh. and, and they lost their little one. And, and the, you know, I mean, the dad's on suicide watch for you, right? Because, I mean, you just, like, I understand that things can happen. And, and I understand that people have these brain farts, if you want to call it that or whatever. Um, there's always some story as to, oh, I, you know, uh, oh, how did I forget? I didn't mean, or I was only going in for a minute, then I got distracted or someone caught it and then I forgot. And then I, yeah, I just, I just think that, you know, you need to get to a point where if you're not taking your kid with you everywhere you go, I mean, like crazy James is, is, is chiming in here on the live chat and he says he, he was out in frigid temperatures one day and he saw a car parked with three kids in the back of the car, three or four kids left in a truck outside a bar. He said it was frigid. He said it was like 40 below. They were there for a while. And he says, obviously, we called child services, right? Hope says this is cruelty beyond belief. And Tracy says, yeah, don't worry about preaching to the choir. Don't worry about stating the obvious. A year and a half later, people still need reminders on how to properly wear masks over their noses. We'll keep up our advocacy. We'll keep up the conversations. Um, But uh, yeah, I mean, geez, what can we say? Let's get to something a little bit more positive. I am so excited for this conversation. This documentary blew my mind. It's obviously knocked the socks off millions of people, including those that had a say in which documentary was going to receive the Academy Award in the most recent uh, Oscars. It is My Octopus Teacher, an absolutely fascinating film, a Netflix original documentary, Dr. Jennifer May there is a consultant on My Octopus Teacher out of the University of Lethbridge. Doctor, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for making time for us today. Thank you. Is no it problem. is it Mather or Mather? 
me either, but me. I acquired it by marriage, so I don't have a big fuss about it. <laughs> okay, good stuff. So let me ask you this. 35 years, a storied career in the Department of Psychology at the University of Lethbridge. How does a psychologist out of Lethbridge, Alberta, wind up as the scientific advisor on a documentary about an octopus? Okay, well, the first part of it is psychology spans a huge area, all the way from clinical psychology, working with people with mental illness, all the way to what we call comparative psychology, trying to understand ourselves by understanding our relatives, the other animals in the world. Okay? So it is perfectly respectable to be an animal behaviorist and to be in a psychology department. People in psychology have a tendency to be studying animals that are closely related to us, like uh, primates, but octopuses is perfectly reasonable. And in fact, I did my doctoral work with an individual in the psychology department. I moved from biology to psychology to go work with him. The other part of it is, well, I was fascinated with octopuses before I came here, but I didn't grow my fascination with octopuses in Alberta. I grew my fascination with octopuses in BC because I grew up in Victoria. I love that. You know where that picture was taken? Oh, the island of Morea, which is way to heck and gone in the middle of the Pacific Ocean right next to Tahiti. I have very, very good taste in field research sites. <laughs> yeah. You're nobody's fool, doctor. There's no question about that. There's no question about that. So let, let's let's go from the very beginning then. Let, let's go from the very roots of, of, of your career trajectory and how you've directed the course of your career. What is it about the octopus that so captured your attention? What was it about this animal that, well, I don't want to make any assumptions, but it sounds like to me really, really grabbed your attention and refused to let go? Sure. I started out as a kid in Victoria working in the intertidal. So I'd go turn over rocks and drop pebbles into sea anemones and see what happened, all that kind of thing. And one of the easiest things to do uh, as a child is to collect shells. And there's a fascinating, wonderful variety of shells. And so I guess up until my early teens, I was a shell collector. Sh uh, um, mollusks include clams, snails, and octopuses, okay? So I figured in my early teens, which is very unusual, that I would study mollusks, I would study sea animals. And the other thing I knew about what I wanted to do is I knew I wanted to do, I wanted to understand the whole animal, you know, that it's terribly distracting watching the octopuses and watching Craig. It's such a fascinating animal. It's such a fascinating film. Anyway, I got to university and I said, okay, this is what I want to do. I thought I was going to study ecology, but it turned out that ecology didn't really focus on the whole animal. And I took an animal behavior course and I went, that's it. That's what I want. And from then on, that was not just what I wanted, but what I focused on. It's fascinating to think about the octopus because they're very intelligent, but they are not in the least related to us. So if you want to study what intelligence is, you can study us. And you can study other animals that are related to us and say, well, this is kind of where it came from. But if you look at the octopus, you say, wait a minute, it's smart, but it's different. So you can capsule that in saying comparative cognition, which is kind of how does thinking happen? And you can say, okay, we've got the octopus, but we don't know exactly why and how evolutionarily it became a thinking animal. But we can make a contrast with us and the vertebrates that are related to us versus the octopuses. And people sometimes call them aliens, which is really silly because they're perfectly comfortable where they live in the ocean. They just don't live on land. But it's it's really fascinating because I'm finding myself getting into a, what is consciousness? How does the brain control and allocate behavior? So 
they're really, really fundamental questions. If you say, okay, it's a smart animal, but it's different, then you have to say, how is it different? And what does that tell us about thinking? How's that? Well, first of all, all I'm realizing is that we're going to need to keep you here until tomorrow. So I, I hope you don't have any plans for the rest of the day because my, my I'm furiously scribbling down questions. Um, I, I love this idea and, and, and my observation, which is such an entry level and, and, and almost ridiculous observation, but it was the first thing I thought of after watching this film was I can't eat octopus anymore. Now, you're going to wrinkle your nose and say, oh, wow, what, what a real Einstein this guy is that out of the entire film, what he takes away is that he can't eat octopus anymore. That's just the beginning of it, though. Um, and I've and I've dove with with octopuses many times. I've had I've had wonderful experiences uh, diving behind one slowly. And I mean, I can I can tell you I've had I've long had respect and admiration for the animal. But I greatly underestimated its intelligence. And I don't want to spoil the the film for people that are going to watch it, but there is example after example of, 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 of strategies and inclinations and instincts and things that this animal does. Uh, I, I, again, I'm trying to not spoil it, but I mean like wrapping itself in, 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 in seashells and things to, to appear to be part of the ocean floor. I mean, the, the strategy behind camouflage and the, I mean, the, it's the, the evasive maneuvers it pulls to escape predators. I mean, it's just unreal. Yeah, you're you're comparing or not comparing, uh, but but as mollusks are saying, so it's like you know octopuses, clams, snails. Are clams way smarter than we thought too, or or is the octopus way smarter than the rest of the mollusks, or how does this all work? Probably what happened, and I have to say this evolutionarily, when they gave up the shell, they had to figure out how to survive. Mm. So if you're a clam or a snail, trouble comes along and you pull back in the shell, slam the shell shut, and then you're okay. If trouble comes along for the octopus, it's got to work its way out with its brains. It's got to use its smarts because it's completely unprotected. And so I think in terms of evolution, that's what happened. That they got pushed to intelligence because they didn't have anything else they could use to survive. And I have to admit, some of the things I saw in the film I haven't seen out there in the ocean, I was absolutely fascinated with the octopus surrounding its shell, itself with pieces of shells. And I believe there's a piece where the octopus is grabbed by a small shark and it sticks its arms into the gills of the shark. And the shark eventually has to let go because it has to breathe. I didn't know about either of those. Just just a new dimension of intelligence, and I was really fascinated. It's uh, it, it the film to me has has uh, impacted me. I mean, and I'm I'm big on documentaries. It's it's impacted me in a way that I didn't expect, and it's got me thinking about a number of things. And I'm still thinking about. It. I mean, here you are on the show um, a, a week after we were thrilled to to find out that there was an Alberta connection to this film. Can you describe to us how, how you came to be involved in this and, and what your role looked like as scientific advisor? What did you do for the production crew? Yeah, it, it's an interesting involvement because it came about because I had been a consultant for the one, one of the BBC Blue Planet series because they have this piece of footage. And in fact, it was the footage that Craig had that he's the animal surrounded itself with shells. And they are very, very picky about making sure that it's scientifically accurate. So they got in touch with me and said, can you help us? Will you go through the film with us and make sure that this particular piece is completely accurate? And I said, yes, I'd be happy to. And it took a while, but after this was done and they were content that they knew that this was scientifically accurate, they said, by the way, I said, yeah. And the editor said, well, the filmmaker would like to talk to you. Is that okay? Can we give him your email address? And I said, sure. So it turned out what Craig wanted is he wanted the same kind of accuracy he had for his film, the same accuracy that he knew the BBC people would give. Okay. And so that was fine by me. But he said, well, can, can you come to South Africa? And you can imagine how quickly I said yes. Mm. And... We spent 10 days 
essentially going over things like this, pieces of the footage, making sure he'd say, well, we were going to say this. Would that be correct? Or here we're describing what's going on with the animal's arm. Or here we're describing what the animal's doing in terms of curiosity. Would that be right? So I got to see footage before anybody else saw it. It was absolutely gorgeous footage, no question. What was it like? I mean, you've got a beautiful smile smeared across your face right now, just even remembering it, just telling us about it. What would, Take us into those first few, when you started seeing some of this footage, what was that like for you as someone who, for, for virtually her entire professional career, has had a real respect for this animal? Delight, probably. Fascination, because I was seeing things on the film that I hadn't seen. Pleasure, because Craig is a fabulous photographer. Oh, yeah. And in fact, one of the nicest things about this is that we are continuing a collaboration because he's a very, very good photographer. And after I got back to Canada and thought about this, he'd sent me some of his pictures. I said, could you do some pictures for me for a research study? And he said, oh, sure, what do you want? So we set up some pictures of octopuses and camouflage. And then we gave them to undergraduate students and had them timed exactly how long it took to figure out whether there was an octopus there or not. Hmm. And then figured out what characteristics of the octopus allowed the students to see it. So it was a lot of fun because we continued to research collaboration. He's part of a foundation in South Africa, which is interested in the large extent saving the oceans. And of course, the smaller focus is on the area in South Africa, particularly the kelp forest there. Kelp forests are relatively unusual. I, mean, I think he had expected me to be really blown away by the kelp forest, but there's a kelp forest out in the BC coast, and I was quite used to it. But they're a very, very important and very rich ecosystem, and the octopuses are a good part of it. So. He's hoping for protection for sea animals in South Africa, and they're working at that. And they're also hoping to set up a research arm, so to speak, of the foundation, and I hope I'm going to be working with them on that. So it started as, will you look at my pieces of film? Sure. But it has continued to be a real cooperation, and I'm delighted to do it. Did anything that that you saw... Uh, change your understanding of the animal? or I mean, obviously, I would imagine that, that your, your understanding of it was deepened. Um, but was there anything that you, that, that you didn't realize before? Was this a learning experience for you? Well, one of the things that interesting, is interesting is as a scientist, it's my job to sort of stand back and just watch the animal, not get involved with the animal. And it was fascinating to watch Craig being involved with the animal. And I have to admit that a few years before this, I was talking to Cy Montgomery, who is a writer of books, some of which are children's books, but some of which aren't. And she also got fascinated with octopuses. And she wrote a book called The Soul of an Octopus, which in fact was a finalist for the, the American Book Awards. So her emotional involvement with the animal and Craig's emotional involvement with the animal made me think about what it is that I haven't done by being objective. And I'm, I'm trying to be objective about being subjective, if that makes any sense. Sure. I've got a kind of an interesting angle here. Uh, I mean, you literally wrote the book on the octopus, right? You, you are the author of octopus, the ocean's intelligent invertebrate, a natural history. Um, one of one of our audience members this morning is suggesting that that uh, well essentially that the filmmaker crossed a line that the interaction that 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 he essentially tamed this animal ultimately uh, says this audience member leading to its demise which actually isn't accurate if you watch the film and understand uh, you know I, I don't want to spoil it all but but that, I don't think that's accurate but what's your sense of 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 when a an exploration like this, a film project like this, potentially crosses the line in, in interacting with, with mankind, humankind, and an animal like this octopus. Did, did you have mixed feelings about that? Was that on your radar? No. And I suppose that there's a good reason it wasn't on my radar. 
he never captured the animal. He never lured the animal into doing anything in particular. The octopus was just being an octopus and he was trying to understand it. Um, octopus, I don't think anybody's ever had a tame octopus. There are people who like to keep octopuses in captivity and there, there's a discussion group called Tan Mo that, that talks about it. But an octopus is wild. An octopus will do what it wants. There's an old animal behavior saying that in the most closely controlled conditions with the most exquisitely timed mixture of experimental variables, the animal would do as it damn well pleases. And that's what that octopus was doing. It was, it's one of the big characteristics of octopuses that I love dearly. They're curious. They're curious as heck. Okay. So there's something out there, they'll explore it. Um, as a matter of fact, generally speaking, they'll take it apart. Unfortunately, they don't put it back together again. <laughs> but it's a major, major characteristic that they want to know how things work. And in fact, I have a study with Roland Anderson, who is the Seattle Aquarium. We found out that octopuses play, which is something that we... It's one of these characteristics that kind of drifts across people's minds that people say, gee, humans are the only animals that can do dot, 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 dot. And then somebody discovers that other animals can do it. There's an awful lot of that out there. But we used to think that only people could play. And now we know that there's a fair number of species of animals that can play, including octopuses, which is great fun to think about. It is. And it, and it like that, that idea of play... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying something profound, and I recognize who I'm talking to here. Your, your expertise just overshadows mine like Mount Kilimanjaro versus a pitcher's mound on a baseball diamond. But, but I mean, it does something to the human psyche, doesn't it, in our, in our understanding of or our perception of another living being when we recognize an ability to play or to interact, you know? I mean, it, it has a huge impact on how we perceive that living being. Yes, and it's interesting because I remember when I was in a lab in Tarkenia in Italy, and we had cuttlefish there, which are related to octopuses. And somebody from the neighborhood came in to see them, and they were in this great big tank, and the males there were making stripes at, at one another, and they were guarding the females. And this guy looked at it and said, he said, it's different. I said, oh. He said, I've only seen them dead in, in the fishmongers before it is different you have to you have to stop thinking of an animal as a thing and think of it as a being and it makes a huge difference and i should say by the way that in the united states there is absolutely no protection whatsoever for any invertebrate including the octopuses there are laws in canada regulations about what you can do in research to invertebrates particularly the octopuses and the squid but in the U.S., you can do anything you like. What What's the biggest threat facing the octopus off uh, American waters or anywhere else? Loss of habitat? Global warming, probably. Yeah. Of course, global warming is going to affect habitat. It's affecting the coral reef very, very badly. But global warming, warming up the oceans, acidifying the oceans... That's the biggest threat to any species I can think of. What do you ultimately hope the, the biggest impact of this film is? That we understand and care for the animals better. That we look at the planet and say it's not our planet. It belongs to all life. We should be taking care of it. Hmm. I, I just you asked yeah no I I mean you're right I, I'm, I'm actually just trying to decide right now whether I want to pitch you live if you need like an executive assistant or someone to carry your bags on your next research trip or something like that it seems to me to be every location that you've worked at is is like an absolute dream and it's incredible plus what a calling uh, to be able to work on a project like this it's amazing is is there another creature in the sea that you would say, like, I'll be honest, I have underestimated the octopus uh, up until now. 
Is there another creature that you might compare to say people think this is just a whatever, but boy, oh boy? Probably most of them. <laughs> <laughs> what a great answer. Well, and one of the fascinating things to think about is that the, the ocean takes up three-fifths of the area of the planet, right? But there's only a very thin skin of habitable area on land. But in the ocean, it goes down thousands of meters deep. And one of the things that I'm watching and everybody else who's involved with ocean animals is watching is what's down there that we don't know anything about. And the advent of ROVs, remote operated vehicles that people have just sort of sent down to muck around in the landscape has brought us all sorts of information about animals we didn't even know, couldn't even imagine existed. And NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, I think that's it, in the U.S., they send down a, an ROV every summer to some place a few thousand meters deep, and it putters around the bottom, and they have a couple of scientists at the, on the boat at the top saying, oh, what's that over there? Oh, go, go a little closer. That's a coral I don't know anything about. And... It's a wonderful time waster, but I remember watching these people were going, well, that's over there, and that's an octopus. And then the ROB went a little bit closer, and I looked at the octopus, and I said, that's not a known species. In fact, I think it was a new family. I knew from looking at it that we'd never seen that species before. And that's true in the deep ocean all the time. It's just fascinating to think about. Absolutely amazing. I love it. And I mean, we just still have so much. To, I mean, I just, I can't even imagine that. I just think that it's, you know, these are some of my favorite Instagram accounts to follow. These ones of like the deep, deep sea. Once you really get down, right? The, the, uh, the organisms and the animals that never see light, that never see, I mean, the, even just the pressure right? The atmospheric pressure, whatever you might describe it as. I mean, just the, just in time, like we're sharing the planet with living beings that are so wildly different than what we could ever possibly understand. Um, I just, I, I approach this, including this conversation with such a, like a childlike awe, you know? And, uh, I'll be honest. I, I, I told our audience this last week. It was, it was like, I don't remember what it was like one in the morning or something like that. When I, when I came, I was just like, you know, sort of avoiding going to bed. That's another childlike thing that I do. And I'm like clicking around on TV and I'm clicking around on Netflix. And I saw this film and I'd heard people talking about it, but I knew I was, I was like, Oh, it's 90 minutes. I was like, well, I'll probably start it and then turn it off and watch the rest later. Or I'll probably start watching it and fall asleep and wake up on the couch with drool all over my face. Nope. Like, eh, I didn't even, I didn't touch my phone. I wasn't checking my email. I was just locked on this story for, for the, the entire duration. I can't even imagine the connection you must feel to it, but it, it did something. It resonated with me in a way that, that I hope that I, I would imagine the filmmaker expected. Uh, and it was absolutely yes. wonderful. Yes. There, there's a wonderful small piece of film called the making of my octopus teacher and the producers and the directors and the filmmakers are discussing what, because there's clearly a conservation message there. There's clearly a message of we should care about the animals. And they were talking about, well, should we say it directly? Or should we say it indirectly? And they left it for people to understand. And I think that was very wise. Because if you can show the wonders of life on Earth, and I know that sounds like Attenborough, but still it's true, then people will see. And I hope people, I hope it'll make a difference. Yeah. Oh man, I could I could keep your doc all day. I mean, people are talking, I, and I, and I'm trying to really balance between not spoiling the film for people, and I have so many specific questions I want to ask you about things that happened in the film. I think I'm going to steer clear of those because I want to preserve the power of the story uh, for people okay. that haven't yet seen it. Um, there's some debate in our live chat with some of our audience members here over over whether or not the filmmaker could have or should have interfered. Um, in some scenarios that are depicted when the, when the op- octopus is being pursued, uh, when its life is being threatened. 
Um, I can imagine the ethical dilemma there of wanting to protect the octopus, but also understanding that life must play itself out. And then there's a comment here from Shalane that simply says, and I won't tell people how the, how it, how the film ends, but the lesson says Shalane on the fragility of life is so beautifully and heartbreakingly shown. Maybe we'll wrap with me asking you about that. The message. It's not just this octopus. First of all, actually, let me ask you this first. Do you think that it was the same octopus the entire time? It's possible there were many, many octopuses there, right? I think it was probably not many octopuses. But se- potentially oh. several? I don't think so. You think it was just one the for, whole time? Okay, wow. yeah. For one thing, I should tell you, octopuses have very, very strong personalities. There are shy octopuses and bold octopuses, and there are mellow octopuses, and there are startled octopuses. And I know in any group of octopuses that you might be testing, for instance, because I have a paper on that, that you would find some octopuses that are willing to trust people and and a lot of octopuses that wouldn't because we're not very trustworthy. So that's the first thing that makes me think that it's probably pretty well all the same octopus. Okay. And the second thing is that's not the way Craig is. Okay. He's part of an organization that's devoted to conservation. He's a good filmmaker and an ethical filmmaker. I don't think he plays around with people's heads. I wish you, you should read all these. I mean, hope is watching. She says, professor, I love your intelligence and your curiosity. Your heart is amazing. Uh, Jen says I could listen to the professor speak all day. Her voice is incredibly soothing. Tell me more. This is coming from someone afraid of whales says Jen. And then Kim well, it's put, probably not a bad idea to be afraid of whales. <laughs> whales are very big. <laughs> yes, I agree. This from Kim, who wonders, would you rather visit the deep, deep sea or deep outer space? I love this. We're, we're, we're starting to put our meta hats on here and ask oh, these I'd wild. Go to the deep sea anytime. By the way, something that is ubiquitous in the deep sea, but we know practically nothing about is bioluminescence. Mm. most of the animals in the deep ocean have learned to make their own light and I'll tell you very very quickly okay, about one particular squid they call it a cockeyed squid because they can't think of anything else to do it's got two eyes like we have but the two eyes are physically very different one of them is the normal squid eye which is very close to the human eye and one of them is tubular almost and very very sensitive and the reason they have two different eyes is that they have they kind of float sideways looking up okay and they have one eye looking up to be able to see very very faint light coming from the surface and the other one looking down is to find everybody else's bioluminescence to figure out what's going on okay that's it histiotuthis Now, they also have three different types of bioluminescence. You can just see those little white spots there. Those would be very, very faint bioluminescence. And they would match the down-dwelling light from the surface so that it was harder for other animals to see that that squid was actually there. Okay. But the second one they have is they have a bunch of fairly strong photophores around the eye. They're usually covered by chromatophores, by dark spots that cause the camouflage in other animals. But when the chromatophores come back, these lights are aimed out at in front of the eye. In effect, they're spotlights. Okay. Lighting up a potential prey so they can get it. And they have a third kind of photophores that we don't know anything about, except we know they're males. They're in the males and they're not in the females. So they're probably for courtship or maybe for identifying oneself as a male so that the females would be interested in them. This is one animal. It's got these three different kinds of chromatophores 
and these two different eyes. I'd love to know more about it. They live in about a couple of thousand meters deep out in the open ocean and we know practically nothing about them because of course we're not out there. How's that? <laughs> well, I mean, how's that? I mean, you're blowing my mind every 30 seconds. Uh, so, I mean, I just, I don't know. I, I knew that I knew that when we talked to you that this was going to be such a special treat. All I'm doing is fiercely scribbling down notes on things I need to learn more about, which I hope is music to your ears. And I think I can speak on behalf of this audience um, because, you know, people are, are indicating the exact same on our live chat. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, I, I want to invite you back next week so we can just keep the conversation going. Do you get an Oscar? How does this all go? Do you get one of these? No, nothing like that. Well, you get to say. I asked Craig if he'd please send me a picture of him at the Oscar. And he said, when you come visit next, we'll make sure we could take a picture of you with it. I don't even know what it's really fascinating to think about because. There's a team of about a dozen people that work for up to 10 years on this. Do they get just one Oscar? And what do they do? Does it go on one person's mantelpiece for a yeah. week and the next person's mantelpiece for another week? I find it fascinating to think about. I'll have to ask them. Yeah, you have to ask. Well, if you ever get your hands on it, I would I would suspect it might be the first statuette on, on campus at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, I'm fairly sure that's true. Yeah. For the rest of your life, you will be the scientific advisor to a an Oscar award-winning film, which is absolutely incredible. In addition to everything else that you've done over the course of your career, Dr. Jennifer Mather. And by the way, I, I want to say before you go, it's, it's a minor part, but it's part of every scientist's life. Science belongs to you guys, to the public. And we help people to understand about animals all the time. I just happen to advise into a smash hit, not complaining <laughs> at all. But we really do work to help ordinary people to understand about animals and the planet we live on. Well, that includes uh, what you've done for us today, which is open our eyes uh, to even further understand uh, such a magnificent creature. Doctor, thank you for your time today. Thank you for this. And congratulations on the success of My Octopus Teacher. I don't feel as if I contributed anything more than a minor part to it, but I'm pleased. To oh, have come on. Just <laughs> accept the praise, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, doctor. We'll talk to you again. That That's Dr. Jennifer Mather. Um, absolutely amazing. What a delightful human being. First of all, can I just say, Oh yeah. Like I, like honestly, like I remember which, which audience member was this. So like I could like listen to her talk all day. Absolutely. Just the way that she unpacks these really big concepts and just makes them so approachable. And then that last piece about making it about, you know, teaching and inviting the public in to learn more and have that that joy and that fascination and that curiosity that she has and that octopuses have. Aren't you glad that we actually covered what the plural of octopus is So now? I didn't sound like an absolute idiot yeah when you're like wait a minute what are you saying tell me more about the octopi uh, she'll yeah. be like well i'll tell you one thing that's not the right word <laughs> see i got you joanne got says you. uh joanne says we have so much more to learn from nature and animals and sadly we are destroying our planet at an alarming rate um and then i, I mean everybody now is just chiming in on kt says i'd like to see her back on the show again in future yeah like next week <laughs> We should just, we could put roundtables together with people that are just, they don't even have to be here to talk about their area of expertise. We just establish, you know, we'll just say to, to real talkers, you remember this beauty, <laughs> they're joining this other beauty, and then we're just going to talk about whatever. Because you can't tell me that Jennifer Mather's perspective on other things is going to be disappointing. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Sam, Sam's over here, you look like your face is going to break from smiling. That was that was a very, very cool exercise. I, I've sat in this chair for every interview that we've done in the well over 100 episodes of Real Talk that there's been. I don't think I've ever watched you fanboy that hard yeah. over a guest. Well, I'm trying to think of who like, else would even qualify. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Like, uh, that was, oh my God, that was incredible. I don't know. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, if you want to, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I was going to say, if you want to install your own octopus tank in your place, Eden landscape, no, cause it's time to talk about Eden landscaping, but I think probably octopuses in captivity is the wrong way to go about it. I would, I would think if we brought Dr. Mather back here, I think she would probably say, 
Eh, just keep them in yeah, the ocean. Yeah, before, before we do that, let me also... Okay, well, no. Well, okay, yeah. No, it's okay. It's okay. You're, you're, I, I called for it, so let me do it. And yeah, Sam's just doing what he's supposed to do. So let me remind you that the team at Eden Landscaping will say hell no if you want to put an octopus tank in your backyard. As a matter of fact, it says right here on my notes, that's the one thing they don't do is 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 captivity tanks for octopuses. Wow, look at them getting ahead of the story. Good for them. However, if you have been staring out into your yard all winter into the spring and and you know you want to bring in an element that, that you've been dreaming about, like a gazebo or maybe a, a bigger deck or like flower beds or a beautiful walkway. This is what they've been doing for more than 20 years. I was telling you, I was talking to Mike from, from Eden Landscaping the other day, and he said one of the things they really take pride in is being problem solvers. A lot of their customers, a lot of their clients, their partners are people that come to them and say, we have not been able to solve this. As a matter of fact, we've hired it out before to try to solve problems like drainage or, or whatever, things that just won't grow. And he says, these are what we, these are the, these are the assignments we love, said Mike. If you've got a pervasive landscaping issue that you want to solve once and for all, check out landscapeedmonton.ca. The team at Eden Landscaping, more than 20 years of keeping their customers happy and still no captive octopuses in any of their projects. The team at Grand Dogs Essentials, Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food, reminds you that they have nutritionists on staff ready to take your questions. If you've been trying kibble, you've been trying raw certain brands, but it's not working for your four-legged family member, well, check them out at granddog.ca. These are the types of families they love to work with, the ones that are trying to find the healthiest possible diet for your beloved dogs. They deliver door-to-door service in Calgary, Edmonton, and Central Alberta. And if you use the promo code REALTALK at granddog.ca, they'll knock 10% off your first-time order. Greg on the comment section says, you know, octopuses in captivity usually don't live very long. They need a lot of attention. You know, the tanks need to have near-perfect water quality. Do not buy octopuses for pets. I didn't even know you could buy octopuses for pets. Here's what I wanted to get into. I wanted, And by the way, I'm seeing more comments on Sherry the Cherry Tree. Everybody, don't worry about it. We have, li- we have professional landscapers that are advising us on Sherry the Cherry. I understand people are giving us really helpful comments like, did you guys know trees need light? Yes. Did you know trees need water? Thank you very much. We're not going to let Sherry the Cherry Tree die, everybody. Just enjoy the tree. She's going to find her way into the ground soon, her permanent home. But right now, she's bringing us all joy. The ethical question that's coming up, the ethical question people are asking about is whether or not, and I don't want to ruin the doc, I don't want to ruin the story, I don't want to ruin the film, whether or not a filmmaker or somebody diving with this octopus should interfere when the octopus's life is threatened, when it's being pursued by a predator, in this case, a shark, a, sp- a, special, a special type of shark, a certain species that's there in those kelp forests. You sort of start to hate the shark a little bit. I'm not going to lie. When you watch it, you're like, yeah, that darn shark, that darn shark. The filmmaker, to his credit, and I don't want to ruin too much of it, documents much of the pursuit. But if you were in this position, I want to put the two of you, Sam, Sarah, in this position, if you were in this position, could you see yourself interfering or would you believe it or would you find it to be unethical to try to save that octopus's life? What would you do in that situation? Um, I could not live with myself if I didn't interject. I know it's not, but I, like I'm, th- like I cannot watch. I have never watched Planet Earth. Is that what it's called? Yeah, those um, docs. Yeah, yeah. I can't watch it. The there was that Disney film when I was a kid, The Bear, or maybe it was just Bear, and like the first five minutes, the mom bear dies because a boulder falls on her, and I'm like, I'm out. I'm out. I cannot do this. That's I, real life. I can't do. I can't watch nature stuff like when, anyway. And when you mentioned this film, I'm sure it's amazing, but I always feel like in all of these nature pieces, there's, they are about the cycle of life. And so there's obviously going to be some gruesome end. So I'm like, you know what? I, I get it. <laughs> so you're not following nature is metal on Instagram. You're saying, no, I do not follow any of that. And I, and yet I enjoy sushi. So I see my hypocrisy I wear my hypocrisy on my sleeve. Sam, right or wrong, ethical or unethical to, to, to interfere and save the life of an octopus? So I've been kind of chewing on this over here, and, and I think I would intervene, and I think 
I say that because this octopus is already in a, a weird scenario for an octopus to be in. Like, this is not an octopus hanging out at the bottom of the ocean doing octopus things. This is an octopus being followed by a diving film crew. This is an octopus that has humans around disturbing the places it would normally hide. So I think if you've already inserted yourself into that situation, yeah. you're kind of in it for the long haul. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. But it wouldn't make for good film right if it gets killed on day five no if it gets saved like you need to have that like yeah the climax and the like the yeah if he inter if he yeah interrupted or stopped it from happening maybe not the best film yeah okay i I have a few of you saying please uh ensure uh this is like is it you uliand i hope i'm pronouncing correctly says please make sure this this video is shareable so i can share it with all of my octopus fan pages all of your octopus fan pages? How many octopus fan pages are there? Let me show you something real quick. Sam, do you mind sharing my screen for a second? Um, l- let me give you an example. And I'm not sure everybody knows this, so we always want to remind people here. You're seeing our Friday roundtable. This is our innovation roundtable. If, you, if you're finding us on YouTube, and the same goes on our podcast, if you if you go into the description, watch this. I'm going to scroll down. On both our YouTube and our podcast descriptions, we always have the time codes for where each interview starts. So, for example, if you want to see our conversation with Dr. Raywat Dionandan, who is amazing, the, the immunologist, you click there, 1946, it takes you right to the start of the interview. Isn't that cool? You, you look down, okay, you want to get to Trash Talk, there it is, 22356, you click on it, boom, takes you right to the beginning of Trash Talk. It's the same on our podcast, the same on our YouTube pages. We make it nice and easy for you to, to, to immediately jump to exactly where those interviews start, and we're really grateful for those of you that do take the time to share our content. Before we get into, uh, in my mind, uh, one of my more favorite exercises of the day, uh, every single week on Mondays, we bring you Positive Reflections presented by Kubi Energy. Let me remind you that, that, that almost on the other side, the other bookend of our broadcast week, so to speak, is Trash Talk presented by the team at Local Waste Services. We receive your submissions for Trash Talk, boy do we ever, to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Make sure you put Trash Talk in the subject line. This is your chance to get whatever you need off your chest. Sometimes it's political. Sometimes it's societal. Sometimes it's it's, it's petty little things that aren't petty at all. Like, like who was it? One of you that wrote in about waves and traffic the other day. If if you felt a little extra conviction in my voice delivering that one, it's because it resonated with me big time. Local waste is all about integrity. It's one of their core corporate values. And that's why when they compete for your business, they're not going to try to sell you the biggest bin They're not going to try to sell you the biggest service that they can. They want to find the perfect fit for your business and grow the relationship as your business grows. They've got countless examples of how they've done this, and they'd love to talk trash with you. They'd love to earn your business. Check them out today at localwaste.ca. You can get in touch with them. Ask for Mikel, Lauren, or Chris. They want you to ask for them by name. Local Waste Services, a proud sponsor of Real Talk. And of course, the team at Kubi Energy. Uh, By now, you know that they've been hard at work, especially this time of year in both Alberta and B.C. with their two offices out of Edmonton and Kamloops. They're journeyman electricians and their electrical apprentices doing installs, residential, commercial, industrial. Some of them, some of the relatively small projects, you know, your cabin, you want to get it off the grid or maybe some big, huge ones. I was checking out Kubi Energy's Instagram over the weekend. They've just completed a massive project, really impressive stuff, kind of a solar farm type idea. Jake and his team would love to help you sort out exactly the best fit for your operation, whether it's your home, whether it's your business, as you endeavor to go green. You can check them out online under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. We start off every week right here, Monday mornings on Real Talk with Positive Reflections presented by Kubi Energy. Sam, can you show me the video of the basketball star? With apologies to everybody listening on the podcast, this is worth checking out on our YouTube page. It's why we have Positive Reflections posted as its own separate, unique file. Look at this, this little guy, three years old. This is posted to us from Jordan. Look at this, look at this. The entire court covered, no defensive coverage in sight. This little one puts it up and swish! Unbelievable. Jordan says shot this last weekend, had an incredible Mother's Day. Our three-year-old was sinking hoops all morning. On to something special. Congratulations there. 
How about this? After all that octopus talk, all the talk about these fabulous destinations, we received this video just this morning. A positive reflection from Tim and Kyla, who wanted to introduce us to their brand new place. They moved in over the weekend, and they're watching Real Talk live every morning near Dominical, Costa Rica. What a beautiful sight. Thanks for taking us there, even if only for a second. I also wanted to read this email. This from Keith. Now, this is kind of personal to me. Bear with me. But it's the power of relationships. Keith wrote in the other day to say, Ryan, I heard you talking about your great uncle Ruben on the show. He was a surgeon out of Edmonton. He says, and your dad as well, Dr. Bruce out of Calgary. Keith says, I've got a lot of interest in them. 70 plus years ago, it was Dr. Ruben Jesperson who brought me into this world. Whoa! He says, I met him years later and he was still the kind and gentle man that my family's folklore said he was. In my teaching career, says Keith, I taught for a number of years at Louis Riel School in Oak Ridge in Calgary, just down the street from where my family doctor had his practice. Your dad, Bruce, took good care of me for more than 40 years. I still consider him a friend. And then at Woodland School, when I was teaching, I was Ben Jesperson's grade five teacher, your cousin. Today, Ben is my chiropractor. Keith says so every I just got chills. Keith says so every morning that I spend viewing Real Talk, I feel like I'm still with the family. Thanks for all your great work. It's a great way for me to start the day. Keith, you made my week with your email. Unbelievable. What a small world. And this from Robert, who wrote in to say, Hey team, just a friendly note to say I love you guys. It's so refreshing to hear adults having real conversations about real things and real perspectives. Like everyone, I am a complex being on a learning journey who only knows what they know. I love how many times I hear things I didn't know that question my assumptions, things that make me sit back and think, huh, thanks for real talk, peace, love, and wellness. That from Robert. Right back at you, Robert, and to the rest of you. Through the course of this week, we'll see highs and lows, strikes and gutters, as they may say, but through it all, peace, love, and wellness. We'll talk to you tomorrow.